And now we can go to our second speak, uh, speaker, uh, Patricia Lopez Yanez. Uh, Patricia was born in Ecuador uh, and currently lives in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. She holds graduate degree in architecture from Ecuador and master degrees in architecture, lighting design from Germany. Has she has completed postgraduate studies, becoming a Harvard Business School alumni in 2022. She has practiced lighting design in Europe and Middle East for over 17 years. That wonderful. <laughs> She now holds the position of uh, Light Design Director at the PIFs, the Red Sea Development Company, and Amala in KSA. Welcome, Patricia Lopez. Thank you very much, Miriam, for the wonderful introduction. Let me share my screen now. One moment, please. I cannot find my presentation. Let's see. Okay. Okay, I might, I had some pictures to show, but apparently I'm not able to share. Let me, ah, okay, I found it, got it. Okay, there you go, perfect. Thank you, Patricia, you have 20 minutes. Yes, great. <laughs> Thank you very much again. And well, first of all, hi everybody. And uh, today I will speak to you about how our Dark Sky Initiative has become a source for design creativity. First of all, I'd like to start by thanking the International Dark Sky Association and the team that organized this wonderful event for letting me share my experience. It is truly an honor to be speaking among this talented group of people as we've just heard who are sharing their experiences from different points of view about dark sky and who, are, um, who have so different ideas. And I think this is what makes the event quite unique. As a designer, for example, I'm used to hearing about dark sky from other designers, but it's very, very unique to hear from, let's say from the perspective of, of other points of view as we just heard from the youth and education and now from environment. And first of all, I am speaking to you from the Middle East. Uh, I'm currently living in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, where I arrived almost two years ago after having lived in Dubai for 12 years. And as you might maybe imagine, I would have never imagined to live in a country that I thought of as so mysterious. Uh, but once I arrived to Saudi, I was pleasantly surprised by the warmth, uh, the pride and the poise of all the Saudis who have really made myself and many expert colleagues feel very welcome uh, to this developing and very, very curious and open country. So let me start by telling you my, my story of my first days in Riyadh. So in my first weekend in Riyadh, a very good friend of mine who I met in, in, in school, she invited me through a, to a family gathering to a beautiful setting that's called the edge of the world. At the edge of the world, which is like, I would say maybe an hour or so from away from Riyadh, you can find these beautiful cliffs. And once I arrived there, I was stunned by the nature of Saudi who, I think that many of us, when we think of Saudi, we rarely think about these settings. But uh, when I was there with all her family and kids, we went, we climbed off the cliffs, we went into caves, uh, we, um, we, we hiked all over the place. And at the end, almost when there was sunset, we had um, um, a dinner uh, of a very typical uh, dish called makluba. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. And it was uh, a dish made of rice and lamb. And it was in the desert with all the tents. And then at the end, we could 
actually see the stars. And of course, you could see the sky glow from Riyadh, but you could see the stars. And that's when it all started connecting for me. It was the first time that I that I saw actually the stars in Riyadh. So this marked the beginning of my life in Saudi. And from that point on, I have been constantly amazed by the nature. So I think that's the undisco undiscovered part of Saudi because, for example, when you go to Jasan, you can see uh, this beautiful sea. When you go to Yambu, you can see these amazing mountains. You can see volcanoes. And of course, when you go to the Red Sea and Amala, you can see these islands with beautiful nature, with turtles, with bats, with birds. And... Um, it's something that we can that we can really it's hard to imagine when you when you think of of of, uh, of a country like this but i think i was thinking like why why am i so amazed about this beauty and it is i think that because of living in big cities so i've been living in big cities like in dubai some cities of the states in ecuador itself and the thing is in big cities is that you just um stop seeing the stars and then um that's when, for example, when, when you go to remote locations, for example, right now I'm, I'm basically based between the capital and site, you start really valuing nature and really thinking of what we can do to protect the nature. So uh, just to give you a, a little bit of a background uh, about my role in my company and why I'm here. So my role in my company that's called now the Red Sea Global is to lead all of our hospitality, landscape and master planning developments uh, from the lighting perspective. So our team is multidisciplinary. We are um, different um, specialists from architecture, interior design, um, environment. And what we do is we oversee all of these huge developments from the clients or from the PIF's point of view. But what really amazed me is that from the beginning, from my first interview and first chats that I had with the Red Sea, the subject of dark sky came up. Uh, so this is a concept that was embedded in the master plan since the conception, since the very conception of, this, of these master plans. And every time that I talk to my executive team, I keep on hearing the idea that it began with a turtle and it will end with a turtle, which seemed like a very nice phrase for me. But the more I get into it, the more, the more I realize what it actually means and how does it relate to dark sky. So um, we have what we call a dark sky initiative, which has been one of the main drivers of this development and has been established by the boards, which is in line with our core environmental values. So at Red Sea Global, we really take care of the environment. We are, we are building very huge developments like hotels, like new cities, but we are doing it all around the care for the environment, which is not usual. We could, we might as well just choose to uh, build towards a commercial development or a urban development, but it was a decision of the creators to make uh, these developments evolve around the care for nature. So this doesn't come without challenges. So imagine if you are, maybe just a scientist or a, an astronomer and you're focused on your beautiful field, um, you have challenges. I have felt the challenges myself because there are many uh, expectations, let's say from the operators, from the hospitality uh, team uh, that make us, make us question the dark side principles all the time. And what we are doing now is balancing their expectations with uh, the expectations that the board, that our executives have with those of our, of our wildlife. How can we create these amazing destinations, but at the same time, make sure that we protect the wildlife. And this can only be done with a strategic approach. So as soon as I joined the company, I think one of my first meetings was with IDA and we started putting the pieces together. Okay, we need to create these beautiful destinations, but we also need to work hand in hand with associations such as the IDA. So uh, some, some, some people that I really need to uh, recognize are a group of international lighting designers. Some of them are, I think, listening and, um, I think that without them, we really couldn't couldn't have the team that we have because each hotel, each development that we're developing have a lighting designer. And this lighting designer has to adhere to the principles of dark sky, which if you're like me and you've been designing for so many years with conventional lighting design approach, it's not very easy to rethink all of the things that you have learned for years. 
So um, something that's very, very good is that we've seen uh, truly unconventional lighting concepts. It's not your typical up lights and flood washing and media facades. We're really seeing like really unique, creative uh, approaches to lighting. And this is something that I'd like to share with you. So I'd like to share with you my lessons learned in respect to the environment. Um, I'd like to share with you the, the lessons learned from the setting the new standards um, in the field of lighting. So something that I like about lighting is that it's a mixture within, between the aesthetics and also the technical. So even though you can create a beautiful setting, you always need to measure, measure your design by, by technical, uh, technical guidelines. And most of all, uh, as I always speak to creators, to designers, to artists, uh, what has Dark Sky done for the creative? So, uh, in regards to the, the respect for the environment, I'd like to talk about the dialogue between lighting designers like me and dark skies. So, before coming to Saudi, I had a great experience at a, as a lighting designer in projects where the approach was very urban and commercial. So, I used to work in Dubai, and my goal my company's goal was to create these wonderful destinations. As we all know, Dubai is the city of lights, is the city of the bigger, the better. Um, but uh, once we were, um, once we, once I was, I was in Dubai, I was constantly being asked, okay, how can I make this this tower the brightest one in the block? How can I make this uh, th this media facade the most amazing one? So it. As soon as I arrived to the Middle East, that was my job, making these stunning, designing these stunning towers, making them brighter, making them the most attractive in the block. So that was actually the first steps that I had here in the Middle East, which is, I think, uh, instead of criticizing, I would like to take a step back and acknowledge, I think that there is room for having a, a, a media facade that's on, it's, it's about more, educating the people and telling them, okay, if you leave the media facade on all night, every night, it will just become part of the background. But we need to educate the people and tell them, okay, uh, we can have this media facade, we can we can have this tower that's beautifully lit, but we need to time it, we need to perhaps use a different color, we need to dim it down. So uh, those are the thoughts that I've thought that I've had after working, for example, in big cities like in Dubai. Now, at the Red Sea in Amala, on the other hand, my challenge has been to uh, to question myself and to tell that my team of lighting designers what we can do uh, with every single light source that we choose, how to choose the every single light source in such a mindful way with such conscious that it has the right shielding, the right color temperature, the location and the quantity, even before it's considered. So what we've discovered is that if every light source is not selected or very carefully, or if a lighting design does not work our principles with our principles, we are putting our sensitive species at risk. We are also uh, compromising the pristine sky. And of course, we're compromising the expectations that our future guests in our stargazing hotels will have. So all of this has really changed my mind from going from the brightest tower in the block to actually thinking like, do I need this ball art? Do I need this downlight here? Um, what will it bring to the project? So as part of, of the, the whole initiative, I've been interacting with different disciplines and of that I've never thought, thought that I would inter interact before. So something that really touched me was when, uh, I think it was a year ago, a little bit over a year ago, I had the chance to participate in a turtle hatching survey with our environmental team and with a team of international scientists. We went to one of our islands called Bream Island and we walked for hours. We went in a boat and then we walked for hours in this island and we were, um, we were looking for these little hatchings and actually, it was worth it was worth all the pain of walking in the in the, in the middle of nowhere and we found 60 of these little hatchlings and we experimented with them we put them in a circle and uh, we saw the reaction to light we saw that actually instead of them walking back to see where they should be 
uh, walking to, they walk towards the sky glow. And that's when it really started making sense for me. How can I protect these turtles? How can perhaps I work with the landscape team to create some sort of uh, dunes of, or some sort of block so they're not confused by the glow of the city or by the glow of our assets and they're actually safe and swim back to the sea where they actually have a better chance of survival. Another very also very special experience was the baseline measurement survey that we did, uh, where we traveled through all our assets. We went to the mountains, to the volcanoes, uh, to the islands, uh, to every single corner, and we measured the darkness with an SQM. And this was, again, something that I never learned of in design school, never would have imagined. And uh, what that helped me understand is uh, the value of having a pristine sky. So for example, the further from the cities that we went, the clearer I could see the, the Milky Way. And actually, uh, at this stage of my life, this was the very first time that I saw the Milky Way. And um, I said, I think we all were stunned. Many of us were not from the environmental team, but we were stunned up about the beauty and we were already questioning what can we do to actually preserve it. So as I mentioned, as an architect and as a lighting designer, you're never taught about environment in, in this depth at school. You're never taught about uh, what is an SQM meter, what, how can you protect the sky from darkness? So I really think that, for example, um, we need to speak to the universities. We need to speak to the to the lighting design schools. I think it's now growing, right? But if you don't learn this when you're studying lighting design, it might take you more to understand the care that you should that you should have when selecting lights. So uh, the idea would be to create more respectful designs. The second lesson that I've learned after all of these environmental lessons that I've told you is the courage for setting new standards. So, and how to challenge the conventional design criteria. So after I found myself in a complete new different environment, I saw that uh, the, what I had been learning from years in school and what I had been practicing didn't always apply if you actually wanted to, wanted to um, design towards a dark sky friendly environment. Uh, if, we, if we give a step back, for example, the conventions that engineers, that lighting designers follow are sometimes not uh, related to the new, new advances in technology, to the output that the that fixtures have, to the distribution that fixtures have. And if you apply these standards blindly, like sometimes you are required to do, sometimes in your contract it says that you need to that you need to comply with these standards. You can easily be over designing or over lighting a, a place. So that's also something that at the Red Sea we are doing. We're challenging these standards, and it's not easy. We can do it because we are designing for ourselves. We have the luck to 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 own these these areas. But I think that it will be very challenging for people that are perhaps designing more urban environments where actually the municipalities require these standards. So again, uh, my, heroes, my heroes come in who are the lighting designers that, um, that we are actually testing. We're telling them, okay, we need to make sure that this area is lit enough we are okay with deviating with the standards, but we also need to assure that our guests will be safe. So um, in order to do this, we, we have created, we are now testing. So for lighting designers, if you speak to a lighting designer, as I'm putting here in the, in the screen, uh, only with testing different light sources, only by making what we call mock-ups of different scenarios or of, okay, how can you light up a, um, a pathway if it's not with high output pole lights, what would happen if you just uh, bring it down, bring the sources down, make them warm, and just use very, very selected, um, select, very well selected um, uh, luminaires? So uh, this has all come. This has all created a, a need for innovation, a need for um, for thinking outside of the box. And again, also stepping back and say, okay, we we might not need too many features, but only carefully selected ones that will make this building even more special rather than lighting every single corner, every single column. What if we choose on the most important aspects? Um, and now, yeah, okay, thank you. And now one of the biggest challenges is also how to how to convince people about, um, about darkness and about how uh, to be less afraid of darkness. So I was listening to Betty, Maya, Betty Maya's uh, 
um, TED talk, and actually uh, dark skies mean dark means dark skies and not dark ground. So people need to need to understand that we can light the ground as we have here in one of our beautiful renders of TPA, who's our lighting who's one of our lighting designers. We can aim the light downwards. We don't really need to uplight many walls or anything. If you carefully select the the light sources. Uh, you can create a, a very safe environment for the for the visitors, for the for the for the for the people that work in these areas. And finally, to close up uh, this this talk, I wanted to share with you a thought that I heard about creativity recently, uh, and it said that. Um, Creativity is a process of having original ideas that have value, and it mainly comes from different ways of seeing things and by interacting with other disciplines. So uh, only, let's say, as a designer, when I started talking with people from environment, when I started talking with 3D developers, with sorry, software developers that are helping us develop this light pollution model that we're now testing, uh, and with our community marketing team that have helped us realize what the importance of uh, creating a um, awareness throughout. Because even though we have these beautiful renders, we can have these very, very thorough 3D models and studies, if we don't raise this awareness and we don't communicate it to the public, uh, we cannot really reach to our goals and we cannot really build these, these uh, destinations that we would like to. So I understand that the relation between uh, designers and dark sky might not be so obvious, but I, I hope that with, with these lessons that I've shared so far, uh, I, I could perhaps put the community together to allow that all of, the, all of you astronomers, environmentalists, start also talking with the designers who unfortunately sometimes are the, might be the cause of light pollution. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patricia. Again, a wonderful job. I can understand uh, working for um, Middle East is a uh, uh, bit challenging. The env environment is different. The people background is different. I can at the same time